So my topic today is introduction of research skills development framework and its effects in enhancing legal research skills of students. Research is a crucial part of the learning process and students start learning it from the first year <coughs> of law. Basically they learn what is the constitution, what is the legislation, etc. But how to go about doing this research is another thing. When we were doing law, we had a specific subject, legal research and writing skills. But it had been taken off and it has been incorporated into the two first year law courses. How does my subject, TORTS, relate with the RSA framework? When I wrote my abstract and my feedback came, but can you tell us, you'll be talking about TORTS, what is the relationship between Pacific cultures and societies? And I said, yes, because my audience are not legal people. So, I tried, in TORTS, I teach about assault, battery, false imprisonment, negligence. That's the first semester course. It is, the second part of it is covered in the second semester, which includes nuisance, um, more on personal injuries, etc. And I said, if I just talk about it, it will be, be very boring. So I tried to find examples. So, towards battery examples in the Pacific societies, the bi biggest example that everyone follows is sports, which is very common in the Pacific societies. Battery happens when basically the, someone touches you intentionally in an offensive manner without your consent. Okay? But what happens in games? You consent to those games, you go and play those games, so of course there will be some kind of touching going on there in scrums, etc. But what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? So this is an example from the Solomon Islands. In Whiteside and Akosawa's case, the claimant is a Fiji citizen who was employed as general manager by the Russell Lions Foundation Estate Limited. At about 2.30 a.m. on a Sunday, 9th of June 2013, he was arrested at Heritage Park Hotel on allegations that his residence permit had expired and he was living illegally in the country. And he was taken to the police headquarters where he was placed in custody. He claimed that he was unlawfully arrested, he was assaulted and falsely imprisoned from 2.30 a.m. to 9 p.m., eight and a half hours. So what's interesting about it, now he comes to court seeking damages, compensation, money, and this happens in every Pacific society. Okay, so he claimed for malicious invasion of his private rights, unlawful arrest, false imprisonment, battery and assault. And of course, exemplary damages. These are technical terms. Exemplary damages are basically damages that are ordered by the court to punish the perpetrator or the defendant. When you look at sports, do you think battery in this scenario is it being committed here? Is that allowed in sports? So for law students, it's a different learning approach altogether. Because they need to be aware of what law would apply. And then there are more examples there about false imprisonment. Someone got arrested on mistaken identity. And of course, then they sued the police when they realized, or the police realized that they had arrested the wrong person. And I've got many other examples. And awards of damages you can see are in thousands of dollars. Now, also negligence. What you do, and if it affects another person, your action affects another person, and they suffer because of your action, they can claim or they can sue you for negligence. Very common example, accident cases in the Pacific. And one of the very, um, one of the interesting cases is Ali and Patterson Brothers Shipping Company Limited. This was in 2012. Now what happened in this case is, there was an accident, the person's both legs were amputated. And he sued the bus driver, the company, as well as the shipping company. Now, if you are able to establish that someone has a duty of care towards you, the bus driver is a poor man. You can't claim much from that person, but you try to get the big pockets or into the deeper pockets. And how do you do that? 
So all that has to be taught to our students. And that was an interesting case because he got $667,000 in damages. That's how we arose the interest of our students. Because if you get a good client and you can get the compensation, then you can get a good fees as well. But they need to learn this. So now, introduction of the RSC framework into the course. Elements that develop the research skills of students is incorporated in the course guide and levels of participation are formulated. Different, different marks are allocated for different elements in the research and this is, uh, this is shown in the RSD research uh, in the table that is included in the course guide. So the assessment has to be aligned with that. So keeping in mind teamwork, specific cultures, um, ethics, etc. And I'm teaching students who will be uh, uh, future lawyers here. So ethics is very important for them as well. And aligning the assessment so that they learn about their, their laws, uh, their regional laws, and compare it with other countries' laws as well. So that they can take a proper approach and get new approaches because law keeps on developing. And research is important to that. Now, RSV framework clearly is on the criteria on which the students will get marked. So they know, okay, we will get marked on this. What we do at the law school, we use IREAC method of teaching to teach the subject for research as well. I being for issue, students have to identify what is the issue they are looking into. I being the rule or the law. E is explaining the law, so they actually have to go pick up the law, read it, and explain it in their own words how they understand it. Then they apply it to the scenario that has been given to them. And the scenario usually we give them is a specific scenario. And they can apply the law of their country, and sometimes the question will ask, what if this offense was committed in this particular country of the region? Then they compare it with the laws of that other country. So this encourages teamwork, as well as knowledge sharing between the different Pacific societies and how different issues are approached in different societies. Um, and then they come up with a conclusion. Of course, being a legal scenario, there will be two sides of the argument because there's always lawyers on both sides. And they're not marked down on that because if, you're good, if you can do a good argument, if you can argue for the plaintiff or the defendant, you will still get marked on that because that is your level of reasoning and application. And that's how we assess that. So, RST framework encourages assessments to include teamwork. So basically those particular law subjects that are not including teamworks, they now include it. Such as in tutorials, what I do, I have students from, if, from 10 countries or 6 countries if I have smaller tutorial groups, I have one student from each country in that group. They would sign up for the tutorial with all their friends in their group, but then when they come to the class, I will put them in separate groups and that's their group for the rest of the semester. So that they learn from each other. Role plays, whatever they have learned, so this encourages them to open up, especially for non students and solve non students, to encourage them, to give them uh, public speaking experience, as well as mood competitions. For law students, it is important that they are able to argue their cases. So we run mooting competitions. And that is included in these subjects. So we, for me, if I'm teaching the second year level courses, we meet with other second year level coordinators that decide, okay, I'll be assessing this in my course. For example, I'll do a, uh, a bail application or I'll be doing a debate, or I'll be doing a problem scenario, etc. Or I'll be doing an essay. So they're all different. So in that first semester, all four second year, second year uh, first semester courses have different assessments and they're testing different um, LSE um, aims and uh, yeah. So at the beginning of the semester also, it is important, like I said earlier on, to teach the student what you want them to present. So I teach them how to go about the IRA. We do tutorial questions, I teach them how to answer, how to structure it, and then test them on that. 
as well as everything's online these days. Students want to Google up everything. And I had a situation beginning of the semester and I said, okay, try to find this particular case. So they tried to Google it up. No, we can't find it there, ma'am. Okay, but do you know that you have hard copies of the law books in the library? Where you can find this all English law reports or Queen's Bench reports, etc. Or you got even the Fiji law reports and one of the law reports. So then I took them all to the library, went through the section, showed them physically how to do the research. And then did an assessment on them for the following week. And I've seen that they improved immensely. So this was introduced this semester into my course. And in comparison to last semesters, uh, last year first semester students, these students have performed much more um, well than in research than the past year students. And that is really easy. So because they have to do so many things and you need to teach them how to go about doing that. And RSD framework for me, it actually tells me to keep in mind that I need to teach the students how these skills first and then test them on the skills. Rather than assuming that they know it from school or from the previous year. How it uh, contributes to better research skills and development? It motivates the students to learn about other basic societies and how the other societies deal with the same issues so they get ideas that they can use similar approaches. And in order to graduate, they know there will be lawyers, they need to know what other societies are doing. And not only lawyers, they'll, they'll be in public policy making, they'll be in parliament, etc. Making up laws. So they need to know which approaches work and which approaches do not work. So IRSC framework made it very clear on assessment criteria and students knew which areas to focus on. So instead of beating around the bush, which they used to do before, now they are specific straight to the point and with some uh, um, assessments, just um, mock kind of scenarios that we give them to train them as to how they will be assessed, they are doing much better in that. Advantages, I've discussed some of them already. It ensures that the staff teach the students how to, how to do the research and assist in developing the research skills of the students that is required that will be assessed in that particular course. Weaknesses. Sometimes when we have staff turnovers and a particular staff does not know about the RSD framework and they come in, they pick up a new course and they may not know that they have to actually map their assessment question in relation to the table that they have provided for the students to assess. And staff turnover is an issue. However, if you're teaching the same subject, it works well. And you can always go ahead and do that. Um, recommendations from disadvantages that we have already discussed. Have more seminars and workshops, train more staff as well as students. And reiteration, incentives and encouragement should be given at the faculty and the school level and make more resources available, especially for online students and regional students. Because from my experience last week in Solomon's, no Wi-Fi, or you have internet, you can't get through, you can't get in, and I was so frustrated and wondering how my students would have been doing, doing their research. They, it's unbelievable. They're not able to do research with that kind of internet. And you don't have notebooks there. I mean, general ones, yes, but not the whole set of law reports because they don't have a proper law library. So I would say that some face-to-face -face contact is important for regional students. Thank you.